Welcome back to another episode of Gamma 20, Genesis, Why the Beginning Matters. Today is study 6, where we're looking at Genesis chapter 3, the second half, the consequences of the fall. So let's start with a word of prayer. Father Lord, we ask that you uh, fill us with your Holy Spirit, illuminate the scriptures to us, that we may understand the devastating consequences of, such, of sin and what it does in our lives. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Right, so let's start off. This is a nice uh, sculpture you can see all over Europe. It's called The Search for Utopia by the Belgium artist Jan Faber. Okay, uh, it depicts a man on a huge turtle and he's searching for utopia. This is the man who's basically living by his own strength free from fear and social pressure. Then he's riding on a turtle, because the turtle's slow, slow progress of mankind. And he's got a big shell, so he's well armed against any form of struggle of opposition. This is man's search for utopia, that man can find himself back, back to the Garden of Eden, as it were, right? Uh, before World War II, this is uh, H.G. Wells, a famous author. He wrote uh, very optimistically, can we uh, doubt Presently, our race will, will more than realize our boldest imaginations that will achieve unity and peace, uh, that our children will live in a world made more splendid and lovely than any place and any garden we've ever known, going on from strength to strength in ever-widening circle of achievement. Here's a man, H.G. Wells, who believed in technology, who believed in the progress of man, just like Jan Faber's famous sculpture, Man on a Turtle. Then World War II came, and after that he wrote these words, the cold-blooded massacre of the defenseless and the return of the deliberate and organized torture and mental torment and fear of the world from which such things that seem well-nigh banished has come close to breaking my spirit altogether. Homo sapiens, as he had been pleased to call himself, have been played out. Yes, all those in search of utopia, when they come, when the rubber hits the road, and when we come right smack against reality, we have been played out. So today, why have we been played out? Why is it not possible for man to come back to the beauty of the Garden of Eden? Well, it's because of the consequences of the fall. There are four parts, the three parts of this particular uh, passage. First of all, we're going to look at the alienation and its effects on man because of the fall, judgment, the results of alienation, and lastly, grace, God's redemptive purposes. First of all, we're going to look at alienation and the effects on man. <clears throat> Verse 7, Then the both eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves lying cloths, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Here you have got a picture of a perfect situation in Eden, where man was in perfect vertical relationship with God, as well as relationship horizontally with his wife. And they walk together, they talk together. The moment sin happens, both their eyes were open and they knew they were naked. So therefore they had to sew coverings. Why? Because of deep shame. This is a radical, deep psychological dislocation, loss of identity. So therefore they got this desperate sense of fear. The God who is supposed to be walking side by side with them, now instead of walking with God, you can see that vertical alienation from God as they try to run away. And they, not only that, they also hid from each other. You see, guilt is when I discover I did something bad. Shame is the belief that I am bad. And so therefore, shame is a sense within yourself at the heart of your being, that you are bad, that you, they have actually fallen from their purpose or their identity as being made in the image of God. Tim Keller actually writes that when you lose who uh, God is in a vertical relationship, 
then you lose what you are because we are actually created in the image of God for God. So therefore, every person in the world, because of sin, will realize that without God, you're actually naked. There's a deep sense of inadequacy and loss of identity with sin. And that is what alienation does. Even though you're a famous star like Justin Bieber, where everybody wants to be like him, if you look actually in his life, he has a loss of identity despite the fact that he's a famous star. And he's searching for identity. He searched for it in booze, searched for it in fighting. Uh, he's been put up in jail several times. A troubled teenager, but no less different from many people in the world because there's this loss of identity and shame, alienation. There's social disruption. Then both, uh, the eyes of both were open and they knew they were naked. And they so fig leaves together and made themselves lying cloths. Why is this? I mean, they were both naked, but now they realize they were naked in the sense that, you know, they don't trust each other. There's a social alienation, a horizontal alienation because of the vertical disruption. They don't trust each other because they have chosen to defy God to self-advantage. The woman wanted to be like God, defy God. She, she took autonomy for her own benefit. If they can do that, how can they trust each other not to act in self-interest and abuse each other? So once you break the relationship vertically, you will break the relationship horizontally. So therefore, they have fig leaves, which is basically metaphorical for man-made righteousness. We, we bring things to uh, control what others see of us. We wear our dresses, we wear our image to control what others see, because if they really know what's inside, they're not going to like it, because our image is no longer built on the image of God, where actually our image is built on what we make of each other in relationship to others. Like a frill lizard, whenever you is threatened, it, the frills come out to make himself larger and more ominous than what he actually is. So we're always looking for the bigger, better fig leaf. Our possessions, our cars, our houses, bank accounts, our, you know, our roles, power and fame, they become our fig leaves so that in the eyes of others, we are adequate. We bolster our image, our fame, intellect becomes our image, our reputation, our bodies. So it affects how we interact socially if we have a better fig leaf, as it were. I remember going to a wedding once um, and basically nobody, I didn't know anybody there, I was sitting there. In order not to look so pathetic, I'd be always staring at my handphone because if I was staring at my handphone, I must be doing something important, right? So we're always trying to hide. Uh, we, we also tear other people's fig trees, uh, fig leaves down because if their fig leaves are down, ours will look better. People use racial discord as well because they polarize to certain groups because certain groups give them an identity of which they can be better than others. There's a lack of awareness of sin. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the cool of the garden, school of the day, and a man and his wife, his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to man and said to him, Where are you? And he heard, I, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So here we have a situation where they actually are naked. When God came into the garden, they actually ran away and hid themselves. They didn't admit to the sin, right? Yeah, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I've commanded you not to eat? Here you have a situation where God, I mean, God will obviously know they've sinned. God has got eyes. He's omniscient. He will know. But why does he do to go to the trouble to asking them? Because God here shows true humility and an honest desire for intimacy by this questioning. He wants to experience the person's true character, whether he'll come clean. So therefore, God enters into the, into the human experience to explore our thoughts and actions, just like Jesus coming to the world to be amongst us, right? So here is man acting like this child, told not to take the cookies in the jar. Instead, took the cookies in the jar, and the result is stomach ache. They acknowledged the consequences because they were naked, but they didn't acknowledge the sin. And that's what the consequences of sin are like. Now, the next thing they did was to blame others and self-justification. The woman whom you gave to me, to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what 
is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Right? So here we have blame game. The man blames the woman. Not only blames the woman, he actually blames God because he says, the woman whom you gave me. All right, self-justification. So here we have the uh, consequences of the fall, alienation, and its effects on man. Once you break that vertical relationship, the horizontal breaks with social, psychological alienation, self-justification. Then you've got just, uh, ju judgment, the results of alienation. All right, so the judgment on Eve and to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you will bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Here is woman's physical suffering when it comes to childbearing. And in true, a complication from surgery uh, kills about half a million women all over the world every single year, especially in less developed countries. There is a price to pay. Second of all, there's a relational alienation. There's a loss of intimacy in the interaction because man is made in the image of God, male and females. We exist, they're supposed to exist in community. The only place where God says it is not good for a man to be alone is without a wife. So therefore, man is made to be in a community. And in the closest community is husband and wife. In this situation, there is alienation because of this loss of uh, fellowship with God. There's also a loss of trust on the horizontal level. So there's a loss of intimacy. You shall, your, di your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Look at this very, very carefully. There are two words here which you want to see. First of all, your desire, right, shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. These two words. These two words, Hebrew words, are actually replicated in the next passage. Here is Adam, uh, uh, Cain, just before he kills his brother. He experiences his temptation to kill his brother, and God intervenes and he says to him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Which means his sacrifice which was rejected. And if you do not do well, sin is like this tiger crouching in a door. This is metaphorical, the personification of sin. is desire is for you, but you must rule over it. So therefore, here we have got sin crouching in a door, wanting to take control of Cain and destroy his life, but you've got to control it. So therefore, if this is the same use of the same Hebrew words, it must mean that women, women will have a desire to dominate and rule over men. Right? The same two words. So here we have a situation in Garden of Eden where Adam was created first, as Paul points out, Adam names his wife as he names, hence he's got authority uh, over the wife. Eve is a helper, he's equal, but a complementary role to advance Adam through her help. And God addresses Adam first, not Eve, about the sin, even though it was Eve who first introduced it. So there is a leadership component of man, but in this situation, there's a struggle. The, the judgment is, he will rule over you, but you have a desire to control and rule over him, which then sets this struggle in intimacy between man and women. And she will seek to desire to control and rule in ways which are different from the man. The man will use his physical strength. The, 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 the woman will use other ways in which to use family and to gain control and of happiness and identity. So this is a struggle that's set into place. And the reason why is because when you break the vertical relationship with God, then sin is being curved in on yourself. Instead of looking to others, you are looking only to yourself. And that's where marital breakup is. Now you've got the Christian concept of marriage that comes in and it repairs this exact disaster which sin has set into motion. The woman is asked to submit to your husband as to the Lord. So therefore, you're re-establishing that connection with God. So when you re-establish, you submit to your husband because you love the Lord, as unto the Lord, it breaks that horizontal dysfunction. And then for the husband, you have to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for. So therefore, the husband re-establishes his role by re-establishing his relationship with God. And when that the vertical relationship is re-established, the 
horizontal will be re-established as well. So that is redemption in a sense, overcoming the consequences of this sin. Look at the, uh, the other aspect of relational alienation is the subjugation and objectification of women. Pre-fall, the man said, uh, this is at last the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Because why? She's taken out of man. So this is equal to man because taken from the side, not from his head, not from his foot, right? If you look after the fall, Genesis 3.20, the man called his wife name, wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living things. So here you can see a change. They have calling her Eve. E, uh, uh, a woman, she is called Eve, which is the mother of all living things, she, which means she's named after a function. All right? So therefore, instead of being a co-helper, it is no longer, uh, no longer is it what she can be to the man, as far as, a, as, far as a co-helper is, she's named after a function, as named after a function which is motherhood. Right, so the identity is based on functions. It's like uh, so for from cows we get milk, for women we get children, as it were. So therefore, this again a debasement of the identity of women, and I can see this all over the world. WHO uh, data in 2021 showed that almost one third of women who have been in relationship report that they have been subjected to some form of physical and sexual violence uh, by their intimate partner. All over the world, two million girls under the age of 15 are forced into the sex trade every single year, right? All over the world. Uh, this is a book by Louis Brown on the sex slaves in Asia, and it tracks a testimony of a young girl. And she writes, I am angry at my faith. If my mother was well, she would have arranged a good marriage for me, and I would not have to suffer this shame. My life is ruined. I want to learn a new skill so I can earn money and look after my mother. No one will want me to marry me because of what's happened to me. I won't live long and before I die, I will pray five times a day to God to apologize for what has happened. Here's a poor girl thrust into sexual slavery, having to apologize to God for a crime that's committed on her. So you've got this altered marriage dynamics because of the breakup, the relationship between God and man. The horizontal relationship is broken. It, they're supposed to be in Genesis 1 naked, then 1 and 2, and, and, and not ashamed. In gen, and, and the perfect relationship, Adam leads, Eve supports in complementary role in unity. And in Genesis chapter 3, there's a conflict, disrupted relationships, hiding. Eve is a hindrance, is a helper. Adam dominates and subjugates his wife, uses her. Eve desires to control Adam. So this is Genesis chapter 2. This is actually Genesis chapter 3. There's a mistake there. Judgment on Adam. Well, to Adam, he says, Because you've listened to the wife, the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. You shall eat the plants of of the field. Here we've got not only alienation from each other, there's also alienation from the world, from the creation which they were supposed to dominate and subjugate. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground out of which you were taken, you, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. So work is cursed frustrating setbacks. If you ever wonder why everywhere you go to work, there's no perfect job and there's office politics, there's difficulties, there's setbacks and disasters. Well, it's because of the consequences of the fall. So the twin blessings, which are one, be fruitful and multiply. And number two, subdue and rule the fish of the sea over the birds of the sky and over every living thing. Behold, everything's given today. These two blessings have now been corrupted. In the relationship for which they're supposed to be fruitful, multiply, there's pain and there's discord and breakup uh, and also our ability to rule and, and subdue the earth is distorted as well. There's also physical breakdown. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground for which you were taken. Your dust into dust you will return. So it, man was supposed to rule the earth and now in, instead the earth now swallows man back. Because when you take God out of the equation, all we are, we return to what we actually are, worthless dust. 
And so therefore, that's the picture of life. King Solomon actually wrote in Ecclesiastes 2, 14 to 17, The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. So therefore, however way you live, you could be a very clever man with a PhD, or you could be a very stupid man. They both walk in darkness. You know why? Because both the same events happens to them all. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said to myself that this is also vanity. So death, disease, suffering comes to every single person in the world. The fate is the same. Your occupation may be different, but it doesn't change your fate, which is the irony. And here you can see the picture of Stonehenge. You know, after thousands of years after it was built, we don't know who actually built it. We don't know what they were supposed to celebrate. We don't know the reputation of these people. And Solomon says, for the wise, of the wise and of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance. Seeing that the days to come all will have been long forgotten, how the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me and all is vanity and a striving after wind, which is the lament of the transientness of life. Why? Because we go back to dust. When you go back to dust, nothing really matters and nobody will remember you because you've taken God out of the situation. Death becomes a blessing because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when years later on, it would be Paul who says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is a law. But thanks to be God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, so death becomes a blessing instead of a curse. Now, why is this world at the present moment? Genesis chapter 3 tells us why is the world always at the edge of disaster, wars, economic disasters, inflation, uh, bankruptcy, looking at Sri Lanka, in, you know, uh, the war in Ukraine. Why is it? So if you are an atheist or a not a Christian, you would blame society. Uh, this is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who actually is a philosopher from France. He actually said man is inherently good and free in his natural state but corrupted by the evils of society. He's actually rightly pointing out there is evil in society. So therefore, if man is good, inherently good, which he's not, we can actually correct the evils of society, fix society. Man is born free and he is everywhere in chains because humans are corrupted by society. All men must enter in the social contract that requires people to recognize a collective goodwill. So you need to have a social contract. In fact, you need to have a constitution where your country is, uh, has uh, everyone has come to agree on what to do. Uh, you can see this in America, beautiful uh, document called the uh, Declaration of Independence. All the articles are there, but this is a country where it's torn apart by, by, by shootings and violence. Uh, in fact, there are more children killed in this country than there are policemen killed, right? Or for example, you say the villain is um, in China, for example, cultural revolution banished the four olds, old customs, old culture, old habits and old ideas. Here's men trying to remake themselves because they think the villain is society and it failed miserably. What about if the villain is certain people? Adolf Hitler thought in fascism, the national movement that says certain groups are bad, exterminate them. Jews are bad. So therefore, if we get rid of Jews from society, society will be better, and this failed miserably. What about our own country, where certain races are described as pendatang, as if every time there's a problem in country, we can blame them and gain political points. In fact, this is Sultan Ispanda, uh, Ibrahim, Sultan Iskandar, the Sultan of Johor, who actually writes, my forefathers said had the foresight to forge a unique relationship with the Chinese. They are not pedatang. They were invited to Johor to open our land and cultivate plantations. They are the Bangsa Johor, just like the Malays, Indians, and others who are all Malaysians. Here's a movement back towards unity. Others say the, the, the villain is the body. Plato, Greek philosophers say the body is bad, the soul is good, so therefore we've got to have moral discipline because we will purify our souls in that way and, and that move towards utopia. And the same 
kind of thinking is with the Buddhists and the Hindus. Desire is bad. So solution is to follow a set group of behavior to extinguish desire. And that's with the Eightfold Path. These are societal solutions. Uh, Pantheist says, if everything is God, and God is everything, then you can't have opposites like good and evil. Therefore, evil is an illusion, which like uh, Matrix, it's, we're all in a computer simulation in life, as it were. But the Bible says the villain is none of those things. The villain is sin. Creation is good, but cursed. Marriage is good, but cursed. The solution is to redeem creation and to redeem man. Otherwise, you'll wind up like that famous author Bertram Russell, who actually concludes, man is the product of accidental collocation of atoms. All the noonday brightness of human genius is destined to extinction in a vast depth of solar system. Only on the scaffolding of these truths can, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation be safely built. See, this is a very depressing exposition of what life actually is. Then you've got judgment on the serpent. And God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat. All the days of your life I will put end between, between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. Here's a judgment and the words used, you will crawl and eat dust, right? Okay, uh, are basically imagery to tell you that Satan will face spiritual defeat at every turn. Uh, you can look in various uh, references in the Bible talking about broken heads and, and trampled enemies. They all basically are imagery to tell you Satan will be defeated. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And this is actually an act of grace from God because Eve actually has affection and allegiance to the serpent because she believes the serpent more than she believes God. By the fact that God puts enmity between the devil and Eve, then it allows the salvation of mankind. It's an act of grace. Judgment on the serpent it includes and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you on the head and you'll bruise him on the heel. The word seed in Hebrew is called zirah. Okay? And it's got three possible meanings here. It could be an immediate descendant, a distant descendant, or a large group of descendants. If it's an immediate descendant, it is Abel, right? Who basically is the line of um, uh, the two true worshippers of God. Or it could be Seth later on who replaces um, Abel. Or it could be a dis uh, large group of people who are basically the patriarchs later on in Genesis. If it's a distant descendant, it is Jesus. Because here you actually mention again this seed idea in 2 Samuel 7, 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your father, this is David, I will raise up your offspring after you, you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house up for my name and I will establish the king, the throne of his kingdom forever. So there will be a distant descendant and this is actually the Messiah. All right. Paul applies this, your seed, as to Jesus. Galatians 3.16. Now the promises are made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but to the one and to your offspring who is Christ. So that Christ is the distant descendant, which Genesis 3.15 is talking about. But it also applies to a large group of descendants because in 3.29 it says, If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs to the promise. So therefore it's singular, it applies to Jesus. But because we are united with Jesus, we are actually Abraham's offspring, which is what the offspring of the woman is supposed to be. So he shall bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. Bruising on the head is a fatal wound. Bruising on the heel is not a fatal wound. It means there will be triumph with a cost, with of suffering. So lastly, uh, we've covered alienation effects on man, judgment, the results of alienation. And lastly, we're going to look at grace, God's redemptive purposes. The man called his wife Eve because she was mother of all living things, and God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin, and clothe them. 
All right, so therefore, uh, there's a hope of humanity lies in the seed, right? Because this seed will triumph over the certain. And here we have got man-made covering, which is basically fig leaves is inadequate. God personally takes life. The animals have to die for this and basically gives them coverings of animal skin. And this tells us that the future, God is going to redeem us through a sacrifice, foreshadows Christ's sacrifice. The Lord said, to, uh, and then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he stretch out his hand and take hold, take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden Eden to work the ground from which he had taken. He drove out the man and east, and at the east of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way back to the tree of life. The important thing is the tree of life because man is created garden Eden, supposed to eat of the tree of life and live forever. Now he is in a degraded straight, uh, a corrupted situation. If he were to reach out his hand and eat the tree of life, he would live forever in an evil, terrible state. Imagine each one of these evil dictators, while each individually responsible for millions of deaths, imagine if they were each alive today, how much misery would we go through? So each man, no matter how healthy you are, will live a certain limit of time. It is a limit imposed on God because you can't take of the tree of life. And so therefore that is actually an act of grace by God. Every serial killer will have his time and then he will pass on. It, you know, it was the famous author Charles Dickens that writes, it was the best of times and the worst of times. And this actually describes the world that we have today after the fall. We've got corruption, we've got disruption, um, and in fact, uh, Solomon writes in this beautiful psalm, uh, poem, he says, in this world today, he describes this perfectly. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. This describes our world. Why is it like this? We know it's because of sin. We know it's because of judgment. But there's a redemptive purpose to all these things. Even though man is judged, Ecclesiastes Solomon writes, I know that everything God does will remain forever. There's nothing to add to it. There's nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that man should fear him. So all the judgment, all the difficulties, all the different times, good times, bad times, they all come together so that in the end, we should fear Him and go back to Him. And the only one way to go back to the tree of life, the only one way, the tree of life is a cross. At the foot of the cross lies the way back to God. May God add a blessing to his word.